The Life of Arthur C. Clarke in five minutes. Arthur C. Clarke is one of the most important science fiction writers of all time. You can learn a lot about this guy through what has been called Clarke's Three Laws, statements that seem to guide all of Arthur C. Clarke's thoughts. Number one, when a distinguished but elderly scientist states that something is possible, he is almost certainly right. When he states that something is impossible, he is very probably wrong. Two, the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. Number three, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Now, to see how Clark's three laws fit into his writing, let's now turn to the life of Arthur C. Clarke. He was born in 1917, and he died in 2008, so his life spanned much of the 20th century. He was born in Somerset, England, and grew up on his family's farm, but his grandmother lived near the beach. He loved the beach, and he would go on to become an avid scuba diver. He joined the Junior Astronomical Society and contributed articles on space and spaceflight to the Society's Journal, even when he was a kid. He couldn't afford to go to college, so he moved to London in 1936 and worked for the Board of Education. He joined the Royal Air Force during World War II and worked as a radar specialist and instructor. He helped develop the ground-controlled approach radar and published an important essay in 1945 called Extraterrestrial Relays that proposed satellites in geostationary orbit that could beam signals all over the world. If you're not familiar with them, geostationary orbits are ones that match the planet's rotation so it actually looks like they're standing still. They don't fly across the sky. That way, they can constantly beam down to Earth in the very same spot without needing constant adjustments. Telecommunication satellites today still use Clark's idea. And what do they call it? The Clark Orbit. After the war, Clark went to King's College in London where he received degrees in math and physics before becoming an assistant editor for Physics Abstracts. He joined the British Interplanetary Society as well. He wrote lots of nonfiction at this time, all on spaceflight. Rescue Party was his first science fiction sale in 1946. It's about a federation of advanced aliens who come upon an abandoned Earth that is about to be destroyed. The people of Earth, turns out, had all left in a huge convoy of spaceships, the largest fleet the universe has ever known. They're a new race, these Earthlings, but they have already surpassed many advanced civilizations. It's an interesting story because it's hopeful about mankind, as many of Clark's stories are. And it's about the limits of the possible. In 1956, Clark moved to Sri Lanka, where he would stay until his death. Although he married in 1953, the couple separated a few months later. And he never came out as gay, but his friends and biographers seemed convinced that he was. And he may have moved to Sri Lanka because of their more lax laws regarding homosexuality. Along with Isaac Asimov and Robert Heinlein, Clark was one of the big three science fiction authors, and he published continuously tons of stuff. In 1964, he began his most important work, his collaboration with Stanley Kubrick to write 2001 A Space Odyssey, which was released as a movie in 1968. The novel version was released a month after the film. The two were made at the same time, which were weird. It's considered one of the best science fiction movies of all time, and it's not an easy film, with slow scenes that seem to go nowhere. But it's broken down into three main parts. The first one is called Primeval Night, about the pre-humans encountering the black monolith. Then there's TMA-1, or Tycho Magnetic Anomaly, when mankind encounters another black monolith on the moon. And then there's the journey of Dave Bowman and Frank Poole, who have to deal with the HAL 9000 computer as they are journeying to another black monolith. Think of the movie this way. The black monoliths hasten evolution. When the pre-humans encounter the monolith, they begin to use tools to kill things. Doing so allows them to survive. The black monolith on the moon is a beacon. When it's finally unearthed, it sends a signal to Jupiter because that means that mankind has become advanced enough to find it by traveling to the moon and digging it up. So Bowman, Poole, and their amazing HAL 9000 computer travel to Jupiter in the book at Saturn. But HAL breaks down and tries to kill the crew. Bowman survives and destroys the HAL 9000 computer. The computer broke down because it was hiding the ship's true mission, and its logical circuitry couldn't handle the lying. Bowman eventually makes it to the monolith, where he becomes one with the makers of the monolith, whose consciousness has transcended bodies in space. He becomes the star child, and he's able to stop a nuclear war from destroying the Earth, at least in the book. 
in essence, he becomes a god. Interestingly, in 1974, Clark gave an interview, which is available on YouTube, where he discusses things like personal computers and the internet, accurately predicting many things that have come true. In the 1980s, he worked on several television shows, mostly about real but strange Earth events. He had contracted polio in 1962 and suffered from post-polio syndrome. Despite that, he continued to publish, was made a British knight, and even recorded a video greeting for NASA's Cassini probe, which went to Saturn. He died in 2008. At the same time, just hours before he died, the oldest light to ever reach Earth finally arrived. The light from the gamma ray burst could be seen with the naked eye from Earth, and it set a new record as the most distant object ever seen. Some have begun calling the gamma burst the Clark event because it coincided with Arthur C. Clarke's death. And that's the life of Arthur C. Clarke in five minutes.